I know, I know. That where did they get that from? Is that like? Um, well, they think they think grinding black children up into sausage is hilarious. It's a recurring joke with them. Do you know why it's a recurring joke with them? Uh, like, is there because they are terrorists and sociopaths who need to be put to death? That's why. These are the worst people on the face of the planet. They are utterly remorseless. They are utterly amoral. They are racists. They are white supremacists. They are transphobic. They are homophobic. They are anti-Semitic. They are fascist Nazis, every last one of them. They are insane. They're delusional. They're obsessed. They, they have no redeeming human qualities of any sort. Hello and thank you for joining us for another episode as we dive into the insane saga of Patrick Tomlinson. Let's waste no time and get into today's subject. As you already know, several millions of people share things online every single day because of the sheer number of activities. The emergence of trolls and troublemakers in various spaces is almost inevitable. Most people who encounter trolls have the sense to not take it personal to block the nuisance and carry on with their day. Others might engage with the troll briefly, only to later recognize the futility and pointlessness of their efforts before finally moving along. However, few people emerge from such an experience with an insatiable appetite for more abuse. This compulsive urge to perpetuate online conflicts is typically associated with the mindset of a troll in such situations, not a victim. As you may already know for Patrick S. Tomlinson, this odd compulsion raged deep inside, even after being humiliated in court and going $50,000 in debt. In the unfolding story of Tomlinson's life, his actions blur the line between victim and troll. And as the spotlight lingered on him thanks to o a a disturbing revelation from his past would emerge, adding a chilling dimension to the narrative. I find it quite puzzling to witness Patrick call himself a troll hunter, a rabble rouser, and a proud starter of Twitter fights, while simultaneously claiming he is a victim of stalking and harassment by the Opie and Anthony subreddit. Even more curious is how Patrick occasionally goes as far as claiming he was picked at random by Opie and Anthony, and that he did nothing to provoke them. Patrick has consistently asserted he's the recipient of death threats, something he was claiming long before being discovered by Opie and Anthony Trolls. In addition to claiming to be a victim of death threats and swatting even before Opie and Anthony discovered him, during this period he also frequently mentioned a picture that he would send in response to the death threats he received. Uh, I have a picture of me, buck naked, holding an assault rifle with a rage erection, and I just send that picture to them with a little caption that says, can't wait to meet you, I wonder which one you're more afraid of getting shot with. And then... Nothing happens after that. In numerous interviews, Patrick emphasizes that he lives in a perpetual state of fear. However, he simultaneously shares images and videos flaunting his firearms, makes violent threats towards others online, professes a penchant for violence, and has weaved tall tales of barroom brawls and brutal knife fights. His life story almost reads like some sort of strange dichotomy. Patrick claims to be a hard and tough guy, who is an experienced fighter and is trained to handle a gun. However, he also claims that he lives in perpetual fear, consistently quivering with anxiety in anticipation of the impending threat against him. These dual facets of his personality appear almost paradoxical, and it's highly probable that Patrick has lied and embellished his narrative over the years, possibly fabricating some details to amplify the story for sympathy and attention. To clarify here, I don't think Patrick is deserving of harassment or death threats just because he's exhibited this kind of aggressive and hypocritical behavior. And I absolutely believe he's been targeted like this before, even though he is extremely dishonest about the true extent to which it occurred. However, I can also understand why certain facets of his behavior cast doubt on his purported victimhood status. After being trolled for years, you'd figure Patrick would have wised up dropped his hostilities, and quit responding to the trolls. After all, he claims to be a gifted person, 
with an IQ in the low 140s, making him a genius if true. Being so intelligent, he surely would be able to recognize his strategy regarding trolls has only harmed him and the people around him. O and A trolls, however, dispute Patrick's IQ level claims. And while internet trolls usually settle for baseless accusations, the members of ONA forums went the extra mile. A dedicated member by the name of Dan took the steps to acquire Patrick's high school transcript, and his findings only gave ONA forums more ammunition against Patrick. Trolls were quick to point out that Tomlinson had a GPA of 1.7 his senior year, which was barely passing, and the transcript suggests that Patrick struggled to even graduate from high school. He failed geometry, algebra 2, physics and chemistry, dropped out of Spanish class, and managed to get a D in health and a C in PE. This embarrassing reveal was still not enough to discourage Patrick from feeding the trolls. Patrick responded daily to every troll that hassled him on Twitter, threatening them with arrest and prison sentences. But as we'll soon find out, the O and A trolls continued digging would eventually unearth something truly shocking. A series of revelations surrounding Patrick's own experiences with arrest and incarceration. But before we hear what the trolls would reveal, let's hear how Patrick tells this story. So we can see all the differences in his version of events compared with what really went down. The source of this information comes from a 2014 blog post written by Patrick in an attempt to gain attention and sympathy. The post details Tomlinson's struggle with depression and how he related to comedian Robin Williams, who had died of suicide shortly before the article was posted. The part that stands out, a few paragraphs in, is when Patrick recounts how depression and suicidal thoughts, which he calls the monster, nearly took his life after his ex-wife callously left Patrick to be with another man. Let's hear Patrick's own words. Life was pretty good after college. I'd moved down to Florida with my best friend, and my girlfriend followed soon after. We married four years later. For nine years, we were a model couple. We seldom fought, started building careers, dug ourselves out of debt, and settled in to start a family. We were the pair that our friends looked up to and wanted to emulate. I'd never felt so happy, loved, and secure in my life. Then, two weeks after we became pregnant with our first child, she told me we were divorcing. She refused to participate in any counseling and demanded that I sign the divorce papers or she would have me served. No warning, no signs of trouble, no money problems, no infidelity, nothing. I pleaded with her, begged for the life we'd built together and for the life growing in her belly. But if she heard any of it, she didn't care. She told me that she had never loved me, had never been attracted to me, didn't respect me, and didn't trust me. It was a lie, of course. A lie she told to me, but more importantly to herself. A lie she continues to tell herself to this day. But at the time, I couldn't recognize it. I was, simply put, destroyed. It was like being unmade, almost murdered. I cried uncontrollably every day for weeks. I didn't have a full night's sleep for 70 days before I lost count. I ate so little that I lost 20 pounds, and if it wasn't for the rivers of beer I drank to numb the world, I would have lost even more. This is when my monster came back from its exile and pounced. Somehow I managed to continue on autopilot, paying my bills and working. But at every moment the monster sapped my energy. It left me mentally and physically exhausted, yet unable to sleep and recover. Alcohol and sleep medication was all that kept it at bay for a few hours at a time and let me rest. At about this time, my beautiful daughter was born, and the monster took her from me. It, along with some less than helpful words from my now ex-wife, convinced me that I was so worthless, so broken, that I would be nothing but an anchor on my daughter's life. That she would be better off if I wasn't around to screw her up like her pathetic, unlovable father. I signed away my parental rights, not because I wanted to give her up, but because wallowing around in the pit, I believed with all my heart that I was doing what was best for her future. It's a mistake I'll never be able to take back, and the only thing I actually regret from that time in my life. 
troll in the comments section, sporting a picture of Dan on their profile, casually asks Patrick if he's ever tried to reconcile with his wife and daughter. Patrick sarcastically responds, Only my dick, trash baby. As you can tell, Patrick tells a tragic and dramatic story, painting himself as a victim of a cruel woman who took away his entire life, leaving him for another man just months before giving birth to their child. Patrick tries to convince the reader that he was manipulated and twisted into submission by his soon-to-be ex-wife. She exploited him at his weakest moment into signing away all parental rights of his precious daughter, separating them forever. In Patrick's telling of the events, he is in no way at fault for what occurred. Upon rereading his account, one thing I found interesting was Patrick's claims that his wife waited until he was in a vulnerable state to pressure him into relinquishing custody. This is odd because one of the stipulations of Patrick's divorce was that he was not obligated to pay any child support to his ex-wife. Why would she manipulate him into signing away all custody of his daughter, but not convince him to pay her child support? To me, that is a very strange choice. But as we're about to see, Patrick conveniently omitted some crucial details from his narrative. The first hint of this emerged through the discovery of an event the O and A forums users now refer to as the Lappening. While browsing through an online photo album belonging to one of Patrick's old friends, O and A users discovered a series of photos from parties their social group had attended around 2010 and 2011. Let's give some context here so that this is easier to follow. Aid was Patrick's ex-wife, who divorced him in 2011. She left Patrick for a man named John, a man the couple had been friends with. The series pictures Opie and Anthony Trolls discovered showed Aid sitting on John's lap while he grasped her waist, and another of her sitting next to him while he held his arm around her. While these pictures could easily be seen as nothing more than innocent, drunken fun between two friends. The knowledge that Aid would later leave Pat for the man in these photos cast them in a different light. Because of when they were taken, they could very likely depict the early stages of a relationship between the two. A relationship that would ultimately tear Patrick away from his wife and child. Unfortunately, the lappening was not the only incident that Patrick left out of his version of the story. This incident provides a clearer explanation for why he lost his parental rights and was essentially booted from his daughter's life. ONA trolls were searching through Patrick's criminal record for anything of interest when they found an arrest on Patrick's record from August of 2011, right before Patrick was divorced. The arrest record tells of how the Portage Police Department received a 911 call about threats being made at a public pool. When officers arrived, they were met by the witness, a distraught woman who was crying and visibly upset. This was Rona, the wife of Patrick's little brother. Rona told the police that her brother-in-law, Patrick, was having marital problems with Aid, and that they were going through an ugly divorce. She told police that Aid had a new boyfriend, and that this was the topic of her and Patrick's discussion. The topic made Patrick explode with rage, and he threatened to kill John and Aid. But he didn't stop there. Rona told police that Patrick also threatened to wait until his daughter was born, so that he could kill her and the newborn. This threat was particularly twisted and sadistic, illustrating the extent of Patrick's capacity for cruelty when consumed by rage. Rona told police that John lived out of state, and that Patrick's threats against him weren't credible. The same could not be said for his threats against aid, however. She was not only pregnant and defenseless, but lived merely minutes away. The police went to Patrick's apartment and apprehended him for the violent threats he made. During questioning, he confessed to threatening to kill John, but refused to admit that he threatened his wife and child. Patrick was jailed, but his charges were ultimately reduced to disorderly conduct. He pled guilty to this charge. Certain ONA forum users have proposed that Patrick's charge of disorderly conduct in this incident was remarkably fortunate, and his arrest and conviction could have had a much worse impact on his life had the charges not been downgraded. The threats he issued could have easily resulted in him being charged with domestic violence or even terroristic threats. 
Regardless, it makes sense as to why the courts would seek full severance of Patrick's custody and parental rights. Patrick has always denied this incident and insists that his sister-in-law lied to the police about the threats he made against his wife and daughter. Why she would fabricate something as serious as this remains a mystery. Your guess is as good as mine. As a side note, Patrick is a vocal supporter of abortion rights on Twitter and is a member of the crowd that believes unborn fetuses are not people, but rather disposable biological material. Regardless of your opinion on abortion, I imagine you can see the irony in Patrick, the abortion advocate, referring to the child he threatened to murder as life growing in her belly. I simply find Patrick's denial here a bit beyond belief. I don't see what Rona, who is married to Patrick's own little brother, would stand to gain from lying to the police about it. And furthermore, Patrick openly acknowledged making the threats toward John. At this juncture, it appears he's likely disavowing his actions in a last-ditch attempt to save his image. Since he went as far to threaten John, I find it incredibly likely that he made the other threats towards his wife and daughter as well. But truthfully, nobody will ever be able to know what went down that day at the pool except for Patrick and Rona. Regardless of if Patrick was lying or not, the Opie and Anthony forums were sent into trolling frenzy with this information. They finally had something that was definitive proof of Tomlinson's moral character, or lack thereof. And with it, they were going to burn down the last tarnished remains of Patrick's public image and credibility. But in the midst of all of this trolling, another horror would emerge. The introduction of a psychotic individual whose actions would leave everyone, even the Owen trolls, shocked and appalled. Although I'm afraid that's where we'll have to leave off for tonight. Tune in to our next video, where we learn about the harrowing and traumatizing swatting experiences Patrick would be subjected to, and the mysterious dark web enigma behind it. This emergent force was a completely separate entity from O and A forums, with its own motivations and goals. Catch us next time as we uncover this mysterious puzzle. Don't forget to like and subscribe, because up next in the series we'll be taking a dive straight into the deep web. Thank you for watching. This has been Cryptic Web Chronicles.